So the title of my talk is how Marie Antoinette, Rosalind Franklin, and Anne Wojcicki helped save my grandmother's life. So given that title, let me start with an introduction. This is my grandmother, Sally, shown here holding her infant daughter, my mother, her only child, in her arms. Sally is a woman who, as a divorced single mother, raised her only child at a time when there were perhaps even more hurdles to this always heroic feat than there are today. Her ex-husband gave them no financial support and she had no formal training to help her get a job. But she's smart and tenacious and knew that with a child to raise, she had everything to lose if she couldn't make a living on their behalf. So she found an advertisement describing a secretarial job working for a cardiologist. You won't need any medical training, the interviewer told her, but you need excellent secretarial skills, specifically typing. So can you type? Yes, she said in her typical soft-spoken way. Well, let's see how well, he said, and presented her with a typewriter. She took a deep breath, sat down, and carefully pecked out on the typewriter. Golly, I'd work hard at this job. Believing her sincerity, she was hired, and she spent the next 35 years working for this cardiologist. Along the way, she became a registered vascular technician and was deeply inspired by the role she was able to have helping to care for patients in this role. Her passion so inspired me that as a curious and quite serious 12-year-old, I asked the cardiologist she worked for if I could have a summer job working for him. He agreed, and in that summer, I got to learn how to differentiate waveforms from EKGs, how to type blood, and even how to use the Apple II computer to do peripheral arterial vascular studies. But this passion of my grandmother's for healthcare is something that really launched my career and it was an important thing for her as well. In addition to a love of healthcare though, my grandmother also loves genealogy. She's the person in our family entrusted with the family Bible, with the family letters, the photographs. She's the acknowledged expert when it comes to the stories uh, and the ancestry and our family tree. So, as Mother's Day approached, and I tried to think of the perfect gift to give her, I happened to think of my good friend Anne Wojcicki, a woman I had met years before straight out of graduate school who had gone on over time to found a company focused on consumer DNA, focused on allowing individuals as consumers to access their own DNA and then interpret that in the context of all the health kinds of reports that are associated with your personal DNA, but also deep genetic genealogy. So given that my grandmother loved healthcare, and loved genealogy, it seemed like a perfect gift. Very personal, very cutting edge as well. And all I had to do was order a kit in the mail, have my grandmother spit in a little tube, send it back in the mail, and then wait for the results. So, before I tell you what comes next, I do want to remark for a second on how, frankly, miraculous it is that this kind of information is available, not even to just us as consumers, which is a miracle in and of itself, but to scientists, to the world. Consider for a moment the story of Dr. Rosalind Franklin, the British biophysicist who died in her 30s. She took the following X-ray diffraction image of DNA, revealing to the trained eye a pattern that is distinctively characteristic of an underlying double helix architecture, revealing for the first time the double helix architecture of the DNA molecule. This discovery, this photograph, is widely credited with being a critical catalytic uh, moment that catalyzed the Watson and Crick Nobel Prize winning work, elucidating the structure and function of DNA. And so it's critical to kicking off 10 years ago the $3 billion human genome project that sequenced the first human 10 years ago. So it's what brings us to today, a moment in time when I, as a consumer, could buy for my grandmother a chance to look at her own DNA. So let me tell you just a few of the things that we discovered. So to begin with, my grandmother, shown here now as a little girl in the center, has a dimple in her chin. It's a distinctive family characteristic shared by many of her ancestors shown in these images surrounding her, dating even back to an 1800s daguerreotype with the little girl in the upper corner. It's one of those things that 
is small, but always made her feel a certain connection to the family because so many of her ancestors had this trait. And lo and behold, looking at her DNA, I can see her source code. I can see the specific segment of DNA in her, her personal genetic source code that contributed to her having this particular trait. Next, we know what seems to be a lot about the matrilineal side of our family, starting with my young daughters progressing through me, to my mother, Deborah, through to Sally, my grandmother, then going back in time to her mother, Thelma, and her mother, Iva. But although Sally's built out detailed histories and family stories for many, many branches of our family tree, when it comes to Iva, her great -grand or her grandmother, the trail goes dark because Iva was adopted. So with no paper trail to go on, everything about Iva's history remains shrouded in mystery. So what can we see turning to DNA? Well, it turns out that in each of us, we have our cells. Within the cell, you have your cell nucleus. And in the cell nucleus it are your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA. But external to the nucleus are these little mitochondria. And contained in mitochondria are, is additional DNA that's also specific to you. But interestingly, mitochondrial DNA only comes from moms. So going back, if I look at Sally's mitochondrial DNA, it had to come from Thelma, which had to come from her mother, Iva, which had to come from her mother, which of course takes us to the other side of that brick wall. So what can we see looking there? Well, it turns out that there is a mother who lived before the time of the Ice Age, who is uh, the, the direct um, ancestor of my grandmother through a long chain of only daughters who lived in the Near East. After the Ice Age, her descendants migrated into Europe and Scandinavia. Then, as recently as 500 years ago, still before the age of intercontinental travel, those descendants were concentrated in Europe, but with some spillover into the western edge of Asia and also into North Africa. It also turns out that there are many famous individuals who have had their mitochondrial DNA mapped using, say, a lock of hair that someone has preserved. And it turns out that Marie Antoinette is one of those individuals. So looking at her mitochondrial DNA, she has the exact same mitochondrial DNA distinctive markers present in my grandmother. So through a long chain of daughters or mothers, whichever way you want to look at it, they most definitively, somewhere in time, shared a great, great, great something grandmother. So. All of these observations are interesting, but they're backward looking. Looking at recent ancestors with the chin dimple or with Marie Antoinette, cousin Marie. But what about what we can see looking forward in her DNA? What can we see about her descendants? So it turns out if you take my 23 pairs of chromosomes and line them up and overlay my grandmother's, I can see the specific segments of DNA in me that came from her. In fact, her DNA, her, her DNA seems to run along the entire length of my chromosome 10, for example. But more profound, I can sketch out a modern family tree, con including my grandmother, my mother, my sister, and myself, and all four great-grandchildren. And in this framework, I can see, again, specifically how her DNA filtered down through all of us and the specific percentage of her that's in each of us. Talk about having your grandmother's eyes. So by this time in the family, I can tell you I was getting lots of congratulations on the coolest Mother's Day gift ever. Two months after we got this information back, my grandmother started having heart problems. Abnormal, uncomfortable heart palpitations caused her to seek urgent medical attention. She was diagnosed by her physician with atrial fibrillation. Now this is the most common heart rhythm problem in the United States. In this disturbance, you have abnormal electrical signals in the upper chambers of the heart that cause those chambers to beat in erratic, rapid, inefficient ways. That can cause the blood to pool and clot. And if one of those clots in the upper chamber travels to the brain, you can have a stroke. In fact, individuals with atrial fibrillation have a seven-fold increased risk of stroke. So her physician prescribed a life-saving drug called Coumadin, or Warfarin. This is an anticoagulant that has saved many lives. It is a, a drug that is uh, prescribed 30 million times a year in the United States. But it's notoriously difficult to dose and to take because not only does the efficacy impact, uh, in, and not only is the efficacy impacted by your diet, but 
it's dependent on how you metabolize that drug, which is, of course, driven by your genes. Importantly, the consequences of incorrect dosing can be nothing short of catastrophic. Dose too low, and you risk a stroke. Dose too high, and your blood is so thin that it can't clot, and you risk severe, often fatal hemorrhaging. Fully one-third of all, of all emergency room visits in the United States for adverse drug effects come from this single drug. So, in addition to all the cool ancestry and inheritance tools that she got by getting a peek at her genome, my grandmother also gets monthly emails telling her about research that has come out and how it specifically relates to her driven by her DNA. Among these many reports, over 200, she was notified to the fact that she is warfarin sensitive, she is Coumadin sensitive, meaning that she metabolizes the drug so slowly that more of it sticks around, making her at increased risk for overdosing on this drug. So she talked to her doctor about it, and armed with this information, together they were able to get to the right dose for her with less trial and error than in typical situations, avoiding potentially catastrophic, potentially fatal or disabling consequences of an incorrect dose. And importantly, it also highlighted to her the real meaning of personalized medicine and prevention, emphasizing that she is special when it comes to this drug. She needs a dose 40% lower, it turns out, than most people, making her exquisitely sensitive to her response on the drug, more communicative than ever with her physician, and exceptionally compliant. Behaviors that are all too uncommon when it comes to healthcare, but that are so important to optimizing outcomes. So for my grandmother, understanding the story of her typed out in the letters of her DNA, a narration enabled by the breakthroughs of remarkable scientists delivered to her as a consumer by visionary entrepreneurs and brought to life in magical humanistic ways by connections found to colorful historic figures, understanding this story, admittedly in the service of Curiosity and entertainment drove personal genetic literacy that let her seize life-saving information at exactly the moment in time that she needed it. So my point is actually bigger than the story of my grandmother. And it's bigger than the story of the companies and people and entrepreneurs and scientists who are ushering in this new age. Because it's clear that under the framework of status quo healthcare, we as a society simply don't have the resources to deliver the standard of care that we all want for ourselves and for our loved ones. Personalized medicine and prevention can take us a distance toward that goal. And by inviting the person into this personalized medicine equation, by giving them participatory tools like the ones I've described to join in that fight, and by each of us as individuals harnessing those tools on our own behalf, I believe this can happen. And the story of my grandmother is one small example of how it's happening now. Thank you.